I just want to welcome you to the Roy Branson Legacy Sabbath School this morning. And uh, this morning we're having Graham Stacy, and we're doing our last chapter out of our book that we've been doing for a couple of months now. And let me tell you a little bit about Graham. He uh, was a pastor, was serving as a pastor. He is now the associate dean at the School of Dentistry for Admissions and Student Affairs. He has taught ethics. And uh, the most important three things you need to know about Graham. Number one, he's Australian. It's very important to him. That's part of his core identity. Secondly, he is the father of three. And probably most importantly, he is the grandfather of ten. I, I share that with my wife. But yes, yes, of course. Yes, of course. So I'm going to turn the time over to Graham Stacy at this time. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, happy, happy Sabbath. Nice to be here. Uh, special welcome. A little bit up. Special welcome to Dr. and Mrs. Johnson. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here for this Sabbath. And thank you, Bill, again. We have enjoyed the stimulation of the journey with the book. I hope many of you have read it, or most of you have read it. Uh, it's, it's been a very good time. Uh, we'll consider the last chapter today. Uh, many years ago, when I was a pastor, I haven't heard that said for a little while, just quite like that. Um, I still got my card, actually. So, <laughs> um, I was doing some of my other studies, and I was working as uh, a chaplain part-time. I did a little bit in the medical centre, but mainly I did some time over in the VA hospital. And over in the VA hospital, I got to know... Uh, a gentleman by the name of Bob Burrows. Bob Burrows, um, I was just about to say Church of England, but he, Episcopalian would work better in this country. <laughs> Sorry, uh, no offence. Um, Bob Burrows was a, uh, maybe I can pull that chart up. Huh? Um, he was an Episcopalian. He loved working at the VA and at Loma Linda. And he loved telling me, uh, he, I, I regarded him as uh, an honorary, I've got to say that slowly with my speech impediment, an honorary um, Seventh-day Adventist. And I used to refer to him as my bishop. He'd been married a couple of times too many to be a bishop, sort of where he was, but I regarded him as my, my bishop. And he used to tell me stories about his experience with Adventists, and he would say to me, you know, uh, Adventist, um, you're the only group in the world where you could go to any airport in the world and you'd hold up this sign and somebody would take you home for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and he was about right. Um, he had some other stories he used to tell, which were just as funny, but we, we won't pause with them all the this morning. Um, there is much to love and appreciate about the experience that we've enjoyed in being Seventh Adventists. We wouldn't be here um, if we didn't have a love and affinity for our history and our church and so on. Bill Johnson would not have written his book unless he had a love and affinity deeply for his church and that's why uh, why we're here uh, to have a little look at that. Let me do a couple of things this morning. Uh, one is I'd like to spend a few minutes and cover the issue uh, of the chapter and then I will launch out and give a few of my own sort of thoughts and opinions about where this chapter has taken me. Um, if you had uh, any doubt about where Dr. Johnson was going to go in this last chapter. Um, in the first page or two of the chapter, he identifies that 
Uh, he had worked for a long time with the General Conference and an overriding goal of three General Conference presidents was the preservation of the wide, worldwide Seventh Adventist Church. We've come this far without a major split, he wanted to point out. It's the Lord's doing and his alone. And then in that introductory section, he says, never before in the history of the Seventh Adventist Church have we been closer to a major split of the church. And as he opened up this particular area, underneath this particular heading, we've come this far, we've gone through a lot of stuff. He cited uh, a couple of stories, there could be many more, but he uh, a couple of uh, profound and historical stories, the John Harvey Kellogg time, the time in Germany during World War I when the Reformed Adventist Church was formed and the history that uh, went on with all of that. But the, the point was, which I think says a lot about where uh, Bill wants to go in this particular chapter, is his concern that we've never been this close to a major split of the church. Um, I'll, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but that's where we start this chapter. If you missed it when you read the chapter, uh, some of the language makes it very clear how Dr. Johnson feels. And, and these are in quotes, Bill, because you can't get away from them. Here we go. Maybe we never do anything, uh, well, may we never do anything to put our, referring back to our union, our unity at risk. Ominous developments threaten our precious unity. The deep concern he has, disquieting rumours, a nightmare world of, that seems to be looming of uh, potential fracture, and then he says somewhere else, the rumours were not crazy when the church, according to his understanding, were considering the nuclear option of uh, disbanding and replacing leadership in two unions. Uh, I was, I am appalled. This is wrong from any ang uh, angle. Uh, it's more papal than Seventh Adventists. Now, I've got to tell you, uh, when a person of mild-mannered nature of Dr. Johnson uses a phrase like it's more papal than Seventh Adventist, there's a fair amount of passion behind that. That's the equivalent of Adventist pastor swearing, I tell you. <laughs> uh, uh, don't misunderstand how carefully and how many times he rewrote that sentence to make sure it sounded right may have removed an expletive or two, but he left it with this one. Um, I noticed with interest that he missed any reference to Babylon, which is another one that pastors often go to. I myself have been referred to as a Jesuit at one occasion, so that's sort of another one you can get to. Uh, but that's pretty strong language and uh, revealing a great deal of uh, passion. So Bill goes on and then uh, he cites three specific, specific um, references that he wants to uh, highlight. And uh, with some apology before I even start, I'm not going to <coughs> drill down in each one of these and resolve these, but these are the examples he uses. And he references, firstly, the ordination of women, facts and fiction section in the book, and he, these are the points that Dr. Johnson makes about, uh, I don't know why I've got the word forgiven there, now I'm looking at that. Ordination of women uh, has never been uh, a general conference. Uh, forbidden. forbidden. Forbidden, thank you. Th see? <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That's, that's like when you teach these days and somebody's fact-checking you on their phone. <laughs> and you say some profound thing that you've been saying for years, and they come in and say, oh no, the latest evidence, and you go, oh my goodness, I've got to get out of it. Anyway. <laughs> that it's not part of the 28 fundamental beliefs, uh, that it's usually been handled at local conferences, uh, it's a matter of conscience and moral precept that we should consider. Circumstances of women's ordination in China are used as an example that you know that we've accepted it there. Why make a big deal of it in these two unions here? He has some strong words about the handling of the debate in San Antonio, how he believes that that was sort of unfair, would be a polite word, a miscarriage of justice. Um, 
and he, how he believes that uh, the takeover of the unions is bound to fail. So that was the first reference. The specific one, uh, number two, is the role of the union <coughs> conferences. And he points out that uh, unions were first established as a counterbalance to GC high-handed authority. I quote again, that in the history of the church, why that came about. Um, and that the General Conference defense of its authority to bring unions into line is suspect, at the very least. Again, carefully crafted words. So that was reference number two. And then number three, he goes at length to talk about the reaction of the Norwegian Union to uh, a study of the church government, governance and unity. And I thought it was only appropriate that uh, if you haven't read it, you can go and read it, you can download it, and there it is. It's a worthy document to read and um, addresses how the Norwegian Union um, has presented its defence, it, its reaction to this. And I think summarised uh, in this particular quote, the document has a number of weaknesses, referring back to this document, and is likely to contribute to splitting the church over the issue of equality for women in ministry, an attempt to coerce unions to comply with General Conference working policy is likely to set in motion a series of uncontrollable and unpredictable events. So again, if you have any uh, doubt about how uh, Dr. Johnson feels about this subject, um, uh, it's pretty clear in the book. Um, the Norwegian Union response to the women's ordination suggests a few solutions. You know, they're not just leaving it, here's the problem, and let's not do anything about it. They're making some suggestions. Leave it alone and continue the dialogue, work towards unity and diversity, create a gender-inclusive credential, discontinue ordination in its current form, and table the proposal and find healing. And these are some of the suggestions that this <coughs> paper has made. And as Dr. Johnson concludes his chapter, again, fairly uh, precise language. For the Roman Catholic Church, unity flows down from the top. It is imposed unity, more like uniformity. Historically, for Seventh-day Adventist, unity flows from the bottom up. The centre of our church is not in Silver Spring, Maryland, but in each local congregation around the world. Bill, I hope I've sort of summarised, however briefly, but that's the chapter. Very thought-provoking. If you haven't read the book, it's a good thing to go and do to read. And read the whole book. You must read the whole book to get the flavour and the, uh, the feelings of uh, how he sees it working. So for me, Dr. Johnson has stimulated a great deal of thinking. And in this group, we've had a great time considering perspectives, thoughts, implications, reactions that the book has made. Uh, Bill, I'm going to say I think you've made yourself vulnerable, uh, which for us counsellor types is a great strength, by the way, uh, in the most pastoral way. Um, I'm sure you could have put different words in there um, and come across as... Uh, out of control, angry, but you did not. It was pastoral and constructive, and thank you for that. Time will tell whether your um, gravitas, your experience, your love for the church, your ex um, time in working for it, your wisdom, uh, will be heard. Um, so I, I know we're going to do this more next week, but for 60, I think it's 60 plus years of ministry, you still got your card? I think because they were questioning whether I had mine. But you still got yours? Yeah. All right. If not 60 plus, it's almost 60. Almost 60. We'll give it a year or two, and then it'll be 60 plus. Decades of service at the highest levels of the church. Um, I think it's fair to say you have a history and reputation of building up, of nurturing and connecting, you know, in your time as editor. Um, I, you didn't say any of this bottom section, but as I read the book uh, over, over the last few weeks, I wondered if there weren't at least little suggestions of, did I really make a difference? And I don't think you said this, this might be a bit strong, but was my life work um, 
worth what I intended it to be. And now where do I go in my head and my heart? I don't think physically you're going to disconnect from the Adventist church, but that's your journey. But in your head and heart, how are you going to feel about that? And I think I heard some words of concern, of discouragement, uh, of frustration, some pain, and more than a little righteous anger. Or is it indignation is the better word, right? But we'll leave it at anger. As to how you see things working. Let, let, me, let me go from here. So from here going forward, I'm responsible. <laughs> All right, so don't, don't read any of this into Dr. Johnson uh, from this point on. Let me, I, I, I'm an occasional reader of uh, different things, and one of the things I like to read casually, um, I'm not an expert in, I'm an enthusiast about, I like to read about organisational theory a little bit. Um, maybe that comes from my background of systems theory and a few different things. And I've read a little of Gareth Morgan. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Gareth Morgan in a moment. But he says, and I've sort of, I've put quotes, but I'm, I'm, I might be a little closer to paraphrase here, but our ideas about organisations are based on a small number of taken for granted beliefs and assumptions. If you read Gareth Morgan at all, he, uh, and I'm going to tell you just a tiny bit more about him and his ideas. Gareth Morgan would say, organisations, they take on the image of and are influenced by the metaphor with which we view them. And that those metaphors and images are, are largely formed by uh, underlying assumptions and beliefs uh, that we carry along. And he, he uh, well, I'll tell you a little bit about him now. He's, he's known as an, uh, it, it's a, back a few years, he's known as an organisational theorist and a management consultant. Uh, the last I read of Gareth Morgan, he was the distinguished research professor at York University of Toronto. Um, and he is best known for this idea of organisational metaphor. And I think his best known work would be in 1986 when he wrote about images of organisation. And he, he, in his book, he, uh, and it's complex sort of stuff for me, uh, how he explores what organisations act like and behave like um, and react to uh, based upon underlying beliefs and assumptions. And so that's his whole life work. Uh, he came out of the London School of Economics and Political Science. I think he did his PhD back in 1980 in the University of Lancaster. Now I know that to be true. And again, a quote from him, challenges the underlying assumptions to help develop a new understanding in organisations and management theory and practice in everyday life. So he goes on, and these are some of his sort of seminal thoughts. Our interpretations of organisations are always based on some sort of theory to explain reality. All right? But it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Organisations are complex and can be understood in terms of several perspectives. So he's opening the idea that not one metaphor will be sufficient. That there are many different metaphors might be uh, at play. Um, and we do a bit of... Um, uh, organisational leaders have to do some work in deciding what sort of metaphor, what sort of image define the organisation that they want to run. Um, I could give you uh, uh, an hour's lecture on how I think the dental school at Loma Linda runs and what sort of an organisation and it's, it's, it's an interesting animal run by dentists and their personalities and this. I mean, it, you know, the metaphor and the image and how they see themselves all plays in to what sort of, uh, ultimately, what sort of policies, what sort of practices that we do based on the metaphors that we embrace. And they're complex, so there may be more at play. These images open up several rather than a single possibility for dealing with organisations and their problems. Um, I'm going to tell you in a moment how I think Dr. Johnson sees the Adventist church in terms of Morgan's metaphors. Um, and it's not all wrong. It's not all wrong. That sounds terrible. It's not wrong. Um, it's, it's right, and there are others at play. Um, but, and this is my sort of musings on this particular, particular topic. 
Um, so if I got that point across, I think metaphors, imagery, and you've heard me a couple of times here where I'm always interested in finding different languages, different uh, people outside of the, um, the, the box that might help us understand how things go. Uh, I like playing around with that in my own head when it comes to theology. Um, I know theologians pretty much, you know, um, have captured that market somewhat, but it's okay for the rest of us to get in there and play around and think about how does this all work out? What does this look like? And whether I state it formally or not later on, I'll sort of say it now, is that the, the idea that theology drives our organisation, probably true partially, but I think it works back the other way, that the organisational metaphor that you prefer also drives the sort of theology that you want to develop. And the theology that you develop underscores what you really want the place to look like. And to, to miss that point is to sort of misunderstand how organisations work. I guess the other point I'd like to hammer home here in this particular spot is that um, just because we use a lot of God talk does not override the organisational structure that we're promoting. And sometimes it supports it, both functionally and dysfunctionally at times. You see, there's an, you know, again, please don't misunderstand me, but when you preface every statement with, this is God's church, in a way, what you'd want to do is shut down any dispute that others might have with you. Because once you say, well, God is speaking, this is God's church. Oh, and by the way, I'm elected by God's church to lead it. Therefore, see the connection? Therefore, God is on my side. And the policies I develop, therefore, must be from God. So you question them. And you're not really fighting me, you're fighting God. So that's sort of, for me, I understand the language, uh, but it's also power language. It's language that shuts down discussion. It's a language that forms a culture, not necessarily intentionally, I'm sure. These are good people, but it's still the language that we use to get those sort of points across. We are not immune from organisational stuff just because we say God is on our side. All right? So I'm fairly passionate about that, you can tell. And it works both, it, this thing works both ways and it helps us define uh, who we are. All right, I told you I was responsible from here on, so Bill gets uh, out of this. So um, I'm not gonna go through this, time does not permit. But Morgan would go through and he has different words to explain his metaphors and his ideas. Um, he would say that organisations can be like machines, uh, very mechanistic uh, rules, policies, uh, structures, whatever, very mechanistic and people have just got to find their place to fit in. And, um, and I, I haven't gone on with all of these sort of uh, slides uh, later on, but we, we work to, pre, uh, to procedures and rest to rules, organisations and machines in which people are parts, etc. Commands are given from the top and, and have to be precisely followed, etc. So you can see in Morgan's thinking how the organisation as a machine uh, would help define what that organisation looked like. There, I'm just going to say it out front, the, the Adventist Church as an organisation has elements of machine. I'm not saying it's totally, but it has elements of the machine. And even the top down and bottom up, Bill, the thought thinking, that's fairly mechanistic. That if only we could turn the mechanism around somehow or other, um, it would change. But it's okay, it's not a false, this, I'm not talking about right and wrong, I'm just talking about elements and what they mean. He would say organisations can be like brain, meaning they're like self-correcting, interlocking, inter-processing sort of things. And I, you know, pages and pages in Morgan, I, I'm not real good at just sort of throwing out one line to sort of explain uh, all of their elements. So as, and I'll keep going for a moment, but as we go through the, the discussion further on, I want you to think if you can see elements within the church organisation, because as Dr. Johnson has pointed out, 
Um, right now, we're, we're at a crisis point. And I, I wish I could tell you I knew where this was all going to go. I'm not a prophet, and I don't know how it's going to work out. The Norwegian Union is pretty confident that the church is going to split. I'm not as convinced about that, in that I've seen the church, I think, roll over a lot of crises. Uh, I think it's actually in danger of something worse than splitting, and that is disengagement and disenchantment, and, and removing ourselves from the field of discussion. That's more dangerous than splitting. I actually, I don't know, percentages, who would know? I, d I don't think there's more than a 10% chance it'll split myself. Um, because we're a, we're a very tight organisation. Um, I'm not sure that's all good, uh, but we're very structured. We've got a lot of things in place that, that don't, doesn't ride easily with sort of chaos, etc. But anyway, um, let me press on a little bit here. Uh, Morgan would talk about organisations to be like an organism. You know, it's, it's sort of, again, um, it's got its own life force and correcting. Uh, let me go over here so I can uh, look at a couple of things I haven't put up on the screen. Uh, it's more flexible to change. Uh, it can adapt and survive more easily. Um, they're focused on process rather than goals so much. More innovative uh, and focus on inter-organisational rela relations. Um, he talks about organisations as cultures, in other words, being driven by core values and things that are that, um, that, that are central to the organisation. Um, he does point out that uh, organisations and cultures in the wrong hands can, um, uh, can lead to ideological control. He talks about organisations possibly being political systems. I know this is going to sound a little judgmental, but there's, there's a lot more political system in the Adventist church than I feel comfortable with. Uh, we are quite a political organisation, according to Morgan here. Now, if you believe political is sinful, then, you know, I've, I've upset you. But if you understand political being sort of what goes on in the distribution of power and the management and decision making and so on, it's not evil, it's just the way it operates. Let me read a couple of things. I, I'm not going to read too many of these because I do want to stop and give us time to talk. But Morgan would talk about... Uh, these are some of the aspects of, pol of an organisation as political, according to Morgan. Um, there is formal power. That's when people accept the right of another to rule and have power, which means they have the duty to obey them. Um, the control of resources. Um, organisations as political, using organisational structures, rules and regulations, um, which is how the struggle for political control expresses itself. Uh, control of decision making is an element of a political organisation. Control of knowledge and information by controlling who gets the information. You hear this sound a little too close? Um, control of boundaries, determining who the in-group and out-group is. Who gets to go to the faith and conference uh, uh, seminar versus who doesn't get invited is indicative of an organisation that's very much sort of defined in Morgan's terms as a political organisation. Alliances and networks include contacts, sponsors, coalitions, informal networks, which give ad individuals advanced information of how the, the organisation operates. I've become discouraged lately as I see in the church that I love and serve that uh, this pay-for-play theologian sort of syndrome that we've got going at them, that people are not qualified to even be engaged in the discussion, seem to get preeminence and seem to be driving uh, organisational policies. And I promised myself today that I would not make any references to American political history right now. So that's, I'm just telling you that's what I promised myself I wouldn't do. Um, Alliances and networks. Control over counter-organisations. You know, um, opposing forces can um, be sort of dehumanised and sort of 
You know, I, I, run, I once remember hearing somebody suggest that what we need as a church is a loyal opposition using sort of a metaphor from parliamentary democracies. You know, where the, the people who are loyal to the country but are opposing certain views should be given a platform to talk. To talk. Um, as a church, I think we're very uncomfortable with the idea. Again, we usually start the God talk then is that if we're really following God, there would not be any disagreement. And again, that's so naive. It's so naive to think that we're not going to be caught up with organisational structures and operations and so on. I think the healthier thing to do is to admit that we've got these elements, put them out on the table, and, and collectively or individually try and work towards the redefining of metaphors that would be for a healthier operation. Um, but that's just me. A couple of other things. Uh, you manage meaning when you convince others to live the reality you would like to pursue. All right. Managing gender, interestingly, comes up in this one. In many organisations, it matters a lot whether you are male or female, and the male stereotype may dominate concepts of organisation. I don't really think I need to unpack that too much. <laughs> uh, and the power, another concept in this one is that the power that you get enables you to get more power and cut off others that are uh, trying to sort of get in on um, the act. Um, so again, I've spent too long here. Um, this is a very, it's, it's a very uncomfortable one where Morgan talks about organisations can be like um, psychic uh, prisons that people can, um, can free themselves but they prefer to stay in the dark. They become trapped by organisational success, by organisational slack at times uh, and the processes that lead to groupthink. Do you know what groupthink is? You know, group thinks a psychological concept that sort of uh, says, um, and the the Bay of Pigs experience in the United States is used as uh, uh, case study A of group think. How people knew that there was going to be a problem to invade Cuba with the CIA, but they they purposely did not speak because they could not criticise the powerful leader and so on. There are elements um, that that could be different um, that that are there transformative you know, organisations in flux, instruments of domination. Um, again, Morgan sort of says that these are organisations that are often administered through nepotism and inherited status. Uh, people get dominated by increasingly strict administration. People are a means to an end. The organisation becomes the end and the purpose. You know, I, over the years I've noticed with some pain um, that we, it's our church, by the way. And I'm going to come to that point next. It's uh, it's very easy to project out from here and say, oh, if only they would change. But so I'm going to I'm going to stay with this thought. But how that human resource policies and the way uh, people get treated are often secondary to the survival and the promotion of the cause. And I think we've got that wrong. Um, but anyway. Um, so that's Morgan. I'm not going to spend any more time with that there, but just to put the seed in your mind that various metaphors, various images can help define the organisation that we want. All right? And I am a firm believer. I'm, I'm a backward thinker here. I actually believe that if, if a group of people decide what organisation they want, they will create the theology to fit that schema. It doesn't go the other way for me. Um, and so the theology would be created. I'm, I'm like, uh, I'll give you one example. Right now we're sort of struggling with what do we do with LGBTQ stuff in the Adventist church? Well, I'm pretty sure that you're going to make that decision. All of, the, all of the papers that come down from the General Conference will mean zip when the Adventist people start saying, it's okay, we're comfortable with these people, come join us at church, it's fine. And then you'll start seeing theology being written to accommodate the reality that we have. Um, I would put out marriage and divorce as another case where it was once your exit from the church and now it's like, eh, let's work through this. There's more important things. All right?
Um, so that's Morgan. Um, oh, I've, I've talked about these. These were just a couple of those. Um, let me tell you a story. Uh, two, two or three minutes. No, I've got to finish in about five. Um, when I was doing more therapy, I had a sign on my wall and it just said, I am responsible. And it wasn't the first thing I would put, point to, but if I had a client that was going on and on and on, the, you know, the wife's the cause of my unhappiness and the church or the university, if that would only change, I'd be, you know. So you know that sort of thinking, that if any, only if everybody else would change, my life would be okay, you know. Dr. Stacey, fix this irresponsible person that I'm living with and I'll be happy. My life will be good. And then every now in the therapy, I just point to the sign. I just say, please, please read the sign for me. <laughs> I'm, well, no, it's not me, it's her. Why don't you just read the sign again? Let's try it again. <laughs> and those of us who have done any sort of therapy know that unless a person takes responsibility for... Uh, their next step in life, hoping that the change in another will somehow bring you joy and happiness, doesn't usually work. It's usually, I'm responsible. So with that in mind, in the last few minutes here, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is an organisation. What you and I make of it uh, is very important. We are not immune from the forces that make organisations work. Not one model fits. We are not determined, you know, predetermined to be one sort of people. A church classification does not override the images. Just because we say we're a church and that God's on our side. I'd like to think that would happen, but it doesn't. Our church is subject to its organisational images and we are responsible. We should not be surprised at our church's organisational behaviour. I'm going to say a bit more about that in a minute. Our church behaves the way it does because we are who we are and until we start changing the metaphors and the images of how we live and practice and so on, which, which many do, by the way. And if I forget it later on, I think there's a great gap between where most, no, not most, many of the saints are and where the leadership is, there's a tremendous gap. It's almost like a 30-year lag time. Uh, most of the saints want to live differently and the uh, organisational structure is trying to catch up. Well, they haven't caught up. We should not be surprised by our organisational behaviour. It is who we are. Our leaders, our leadership model is directly related to its underlying assumptions and taken for granted beliefs. Transformations can happen and we are responsible. And then, so I'm not quite finished yet, but you know, what organisation would you like to have? Is the question. Not, the question is, how are those leaders going to change? The question is, what organisational structure and behaviour and metaphor do you want to have? And when that starts to take root, um, whatever. Now, this is going to come across as a bit negative, and I tried to sort of practice that out of my head at 4 o'clock this morning, but um, I, I think I can find... The church, in some ways, is quite schizophrenic. You know, on, on one hand, we've got a lot of uh, emphasis being given to connected, to partnershiping and to equality and being humble about who we are and realistic and, uh, and understanding security. And, you know, one of the most dangerous doctrines that we've ever taught. You know what it is? The most dangerous doctrine? Righteousness by faith. Because the saints at that moment said, I don't have to be frightened of all of this stuff. My security is with Jesus Christ. All of this structure stuff, you want to take away my church membership? I mean, you know, we don't want them to do it, but come on. My security is in Jesus and, and, and the, all of this other stuff is just secondary to that. That's righteousness by faith to me. When I first heard that emphasis coming through years and years ago, I thought, there's going to be trouble. 
There's going to be trouble. Not everybody sought through the implications of this one. Uh, people are going to feel comfortable to uh, put their centrality in Jesus Christ and, and all the rest of it will become secondary. Um, no wonder there was a quick rush to, oh, let's talk about sanctification. We must not, you know, because I think some saw already the problem. So, and the conditional acceptance and so on. But we have a history. We have a history of talking about separateness. <coughs> you know? It's not by accident that we built colleges 70 miles from the nearest sin. You know? <laughs> you know? Don't deal with these people. Be away from them called out, separate from. Um, you know, you know the words uh, as well as I do. Uh, we're God's church. Even that sort of grates on me these days because what does it say about the others who are sincerely seeking God and finding God as well? Um, you know, remnant, come out of Babylon, a, a, a apostate prostitute. We, we worked really hard to be separate for a long time. I actually think a lot of this stuff was to do with the fact that we were immature. We were, we were just a juvenile institution. We, we were young. We, we didn't have the maturity to say, it's all right to treat somebody equally. We had to be better than. And so we wrote up about how many hospitals we started, the churches we started, the numbers we brought in, and how that we were better. You know, we, we've done a lot of this, you know, exclusive separateness, um, exclusivity. Um, and by the way, I'm just going to say, trying to out-duel each other with texts and spirit of prophecy quotes as to who's got the best set <laughs> is counterproductive. I, can find, I think I can find a text or a spirit of prophecy for pretty much anything you want. And it just depends on which collection you put together on which day. Now, you can be pretty convinced that it's defending your argument or not. But I think we have to sort of think, they're important, but we've got to think actually bigger than that. What sort of thing do we want to do here? Where are we in God's scheme of things? What part do we play in the advancement of the gospel and the, and the mission of, of the church and God's will on this earth? You know, are we superior, you know, uh, uh, do we define ourselves only by our... We, we could be triumphant for our first 50 years because we were putting stuff up all the time. We're a lot more quiet about it now as we're closing down institutions and shutting them off and, and so on. We're a lot more quiet than we used to be. Um, stuff has not worked out as our sincerely believing saints that set us up. Um, stuff has not worked out as, as everybody intended it should be. You know, short-term, sprint rush to the line, we're the centre of the world, the whole world will look at us, we're it. It's just not worked out that way. And so you either abandon it every get or together or prayerfully we say, God, what do you want of us going forward? Because we know it's not a sprint anymore. We now know it's at least middle distance, maybe long distance. What part do we play in your kingdom? No. So I think we did a lot of this. Again, I'm not calling these people insincere. I'm not calling them wrong. I'm just saying developmentally, organisationally, um, that's where we were. And now we're in, I think, uh, quite a different spot. Probably enough of that. Um, our church is not divorced from its images. In many respects, it's schizophrenic. I've talked about that. <laughs> The people on one side are sort of demonstrating certainly and, and organisationally we seem to be doing other things. Um, but it's our church. As we mature, what images do we need, prefer, demand? New attitudes, policies, practices can emerge. So, here's my last little bit. Back to the therapist. Just imagine, you go to sleep tonight and you wake in the morning, which is a good start. <laughs> And overnight, a miracle has happened. And when you wake up tomorrow, our church is functioning as you believe it should. Now, I can let you out easy by saying, uh, what have other people done to change themselves so it's a church that I think is better? But I'll leave it with, what did you do to make it like that? 
Bill, I want to thank you sincerely for the, and we'll talk about this more next week, for the stimulation that you've provided for us in the book. Uh, the courage, the passion that you put into it. Uh, easy for somebody like us to sort of maybe try those sort of things, but for somebody with the reputation that you have, we thank you uh, for all that you've done. So, talk with each other or with me. Okay. I'm going to pass this microphone around and try to make your question as concise as possible. And I'm going to, Laura's going to keep her eye on you and then I'm going to. Dr. Stacy, thank you so much for um, bringing up political science theories. <laughs> um, I appreciate that, but I, I, I'm going to take a little bit of a different start. Um, organizations do happen and they all look like that. And uh, in my field of political science, I know that people do not want to be engaged all the time at the leadership level. We elect representatives. Jethro sure. told Moses, sure. get leaders. And so none of us would like to be engaged in the leadership all the time. So organizations do form. They do. And no matter what kind of organization, those kind of things will happen. Our theology becomes that. So I think the tension that you're talking about is what kind of a theology we want to have in our organization. Google, for example, has had an organization try to be equal, and they run into troubles as well. So we really don't have an excellent model to create an organization that is free from equality or free from the model that you just described as an organizational level or bureaucracy. Jesus was not an organization builder. <coughs> Paul was. Yeah. And so the tension will continue to exist. You need leaders. Sure. We don't all well, want to be leaders. I, I, I let them thank you. I, I don't disagree, of course. Leaders must, must emerge. Uh, because we don't want to be doing it all ourselves. Now, how we, and, and I think Dr. Johnson has brought this up on several occasions, um, but how we elect those, I think we've got, we've been too successful, we are too big to go with the model of sort of decision making, policy making that we do. Uh, heaven forbid that I suggest that, you know, we, we should put in another layer, but, uh, and I'm not really, I haven't thought this through, but. You know, uh, the U.S. traditionally has benefited from having a Senate that it reviews and, you know, that there's these people that do the scurrying around and these people review. Uh, you know, you could argue whether those are adequate models or not. Uh, but I think the way we elect um, needs somebody better than me to think about how that process goes. Because I think there are a lot of people who are quite frustrated and maybe even disengaged by the fact that it makes no difference. I, I have no influence here, so I'm just out of this. So, at your point, well taken. Donna, did you want to? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll come here. Then I'll come back. Sorry. Um, the point that you mentioned, uh, that the church is of God, and the church chooses the president or the leaders, and the church makes the policy, that means God endorses what the church does. Yeah. But the Elder Wilson Chap uh, article on the latest review says that we have a way to deal with disagreements. Yeah. So there is not settled that. But they are sitting there as a keen or kingly power. There is a way. And I have a question. Um, in San Antonio, on the Church Manual of Reasons for Discipline, uh, number 11 says, Persistent refusal to recognize properly constituted church authority. Yeah. So, you think that um, if you disrespect authority, church authority, you are uh, to be disciplined? Well, you know, uh, firstly, uh, good statement. Uh, that's the sort of statement an authoritarian sort of group puts in place, so it shuts down dissent. Um, it's okay to do that, and if the church wants to go with you dissent, we'll discipline you, that's fine. Uh, again, um, 
My, my relationship with God is predicated on my knowing Jesus and I'm secure in that. Uh, if I step too far out of line and the church says, hand me in the card, I don't want to, I might fight back, but it doesn't make any difference in the long term. So um, I, I understand that, but, but that's also generate, that's not, that's not divine, that's a human response to how we organise ourselves. And yet, we have rules, and I, I'm not against all rules, we need to operate, but I think it is okay uh, to question, you know, and it is okay to be, in parliamentary terms, a loyal opposition. Um, I don't think that's antithetical to being a, a loyal Seventh Adventist. I was just going to say, in governmental theory, at least in, in our form of government, we have a contract between the, the, so that the governed concede control to the governors yes. uh, in exchange for certain kinds of benefits sure. that the organization is able to provide that the individuals cannot provide for themselves. Sure. Sure. When the contract terms begin to change and the governors no longer provide the benefits uh, that the governed have agreed to cede control uh, in exchange for, then you have a revolution or uh, some kind of, of uh, chaotic change. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a church organization, it seems to me you have a sort of a third party there in, in, in the hands yeah. of God. You know? So that when the governors begin to uh, refer or take unto themselves this divine power, then you have a much more serious problem. We can vote our presidents, our senators, our representatives. We can at least vote them out. But we don't have that release mechanism in this church. And so I'm not sure the Norwegians are yeah. entirely wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, uh, uh, I, I, I take your point. I, I, I think I said I've got I've got no prophecy with how I think this will end, you know, and it might be chaotic. Um, I, I understand that. Um, I do think, though, I, I remember talking to a friend of mine once and I said, um, what, what about, um, <laughs> he was being a little cynical, I said, what about retirement sort of stuff? Do you think, you know, with the church, have we got it good? And he says, oh, I just follow what the brethren say. They're going to take care of themselves, so if I just follow that, we'll be, we'll be right. Um, but I do think our church leaders, and again, I'm not meaning this negatively, but if we go back to the political thing, um, they are very, I think, more sensitised than we would like sometimes to acknowledge. Um, they also get re-elected. They have terms. Uh, they have to go and find people in agreement with them and so on. It's not that unlike the local senator sort of keeping his eye on the next election. So they, I think they are responsible to where, uh, somewhat, uh, where the uh, the church, where the people want to go. But well, well said, well point. Calvin, thank you. Yeah, I was just thinking about the, some of the history of philosophy of church organization leadership, and of course you're familiar with the church growth organization. We have a movement which had a very, very strong emphasis on strong, you know, robust, authoritarian pastoral leadership, and then we had the emerging church movement, which kind of went totally the upper, opposite direction, said let's flatten everything, let's make everything completely democratic. And you know, they thought, well, you know, they, these were mostly young pastors who had grown up under these highly authoritarian senior pastors of mega churches. And so they were going to go the opposite way, completely flatten everything. Right. And the emerging church movement is also really floundering. Um, I have a statement, and maybe you could get a comment. I, it seems like you know we need some kind of structure and leadership that flattening everything isn't going to work. But I'm wondering if you know when we get so disillusioned with what's happening at the very top, the danger is that we wouldn't study the places in the organizational structure where we can make an influence. I like a lot of things happening in the Southeastern California Conference, for mm -hmm. example, and I think that by investing there, uh, you know, if we get so disillusioned, we just say, oh, forget the whole thing, you know, we, we lose that power. I think the Pacific Union is trying to carve out some territory that is, that is distinctive, and those leaders might feel abandoned, that they're out on their own, that, 
you know, that everybody's saying, let's just go flat and organizationally flattened, and then we're not looking for those, those organizational places. I mean, as I say, the emerging church uh, movement has impressed upon me what happens when you don't have organization and leadership. And so there are places where we might invest and and we maybe even need to invest in order to keep something alive and just okay. you know, comments on no, no I'm, I'm not going to uh, add any more to that that's well said Calvin thank you uh, that's a that's a good point um, I will sort of jump sideways a little bit you know one of the things that saddened me because uh, I've had a long history now working for the church is that um, uh, on many levels, we seem to have, uh, us, I mean us, not, not uh, we seem to have abandoned the engaging with ideas, you know, um, and, and I know I make light of it, but I understand that there's a part for experience in religion, you know, and how do I feel about this, and you know, the happy clappy sort of thing. I understand that that's nice, but we've not, we've not helped ourselves by, by, um, removing ourselves from the field of engagement with ideas. Uh, the Adventist Church uh, became strong, and I think appropriately, by wrestling with ideas. And, and we, we need to continue to do that. And I, I watch with sadness when people say, oh, I don't talk about doctrine anymore, or, you know, I just, I just want to know that I feel happy today. Well, um, you're on a road to nowhere with that, and, and I'm, I'm saddened by that. So that's a little bit of something. Yes, ma'am. If um, your uh, scenario here of, about a miracle happening, I would want to wake up to an honest church that was uh, able to say that we do have politics going on sure. within our church. Mm -hmm. We deny so much of what is present, and then we try to be secretive about things. Yeah. I mean, you know, we develop these uh, things at the general conference, and we're not going to let them out until the very last minute, and then we're going to throw them on you, and then we're going to expect you all to vote and approve, uh, as opposed to having a good kind of uh, open and right. honest. Right. Um, I think system. what I hear you saying is um, that you would be comfortable yeah. and feel comfortable enough and strong enough uh, to an increased vulnerability. Um, and, you know, again, I'll go back to the therapist part of me that uh, those of us who sit in rooms with people trying to help them move forward in their life, we're not, we're not frightened by uh, and we encourage this more this is what it is, this is real, this is open. And that vulnerability and acknowledgement of uh, imperfections, you know, we made a mistake here, we're doing better there, um, this was good. This is all, for me, very healthy. Uh, 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 any organisation can grow with that amount of uh, openness and, uh, and uh, looking at the issues as they face them. We get into trouble when we try and play the sort of perfectionistic, um, uh, triumphalistic sort of, no, this is not us, we're not this, we're different from everybody else. Uh, I wasn't going to mention it, but you know, I mean, we're, we're a very human organisation. I'm not in any way um, happy about this, but, you know, financial crises, we've seen a few, right? Uh, mismanagement, we've seen a few of those. Uh, domestic violence, we've seen far too much. Uh, child abuse in the Adventist Church is probably at rates not much different from other organisations. I'm not saying that we need God's grace. We're not that much different. Let's, let's, let's move forward. All right, I need to stop. Okay, and, and God has shown me it's now time to stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next week we are going to continue this discussion uh, with uh, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Stacy, we'll be discussing the book. And so uh, this will be kind of a wrap up uh, of the book. So uh, we appreciate you here today. Uh, I would just like to say one thing, because I do have a microphone. <laughs> and that is, I've been in four unions uh, in North American Division, and they're all different. So we talk about this monolithic Seventh Adventist Church. That ain't true. 
And so, um, and I agree with Calvin. I think the Pacific Union is really a bellwether, uh, pioneering of many of these issues. So uh, we're glad for that. And so at this time, we're going to read our benediction. And I think you'll stay around a little longer. And so people can call upon your wisdom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Yeah,